All right. Hello to everybody that is tuning in tonight for another episode with the Coach's Corner. Everybody is going to be getting settled in. And so while they're doing that, just a couple words for our viewers. If you are watching and you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. I'll be keeping an eye out for any of those burning questions to pass on. If we can't get to anything tonight, uh, feel free to head over to the Coach's Corner because they're amazing and wonderful and fabulous. And they'll be sure to help you out there too. And with that being said, I am passing this off to our wonderful host tonight, Luke Sean. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us for the Coach's Corner. Uh, we have a really great episode uh, tonight, uh, one that's uh, been, been a, while, uh, a while in the workings. Uh, we've been kind of trying to put this together with a discussion with um, some of the women fighters of our sport. And um, yeah, tonight we're gonna, we are going to be talking about uh, women in our sport and how to make a better culture and a better environment. Uh, that is uh, more inviting uh, to uh, women and gender minorities. And um, tonight uh, I'm joined as, uh, with, as co-host um, by his Grace Branos, uh, one of our coaches. And uh, we have a number of women who have been uh, kind enough to join us uh, for this discussion tonight. Uh, and we'll introduce them and just let them introduce themselves in just a second. Uh, we have uh, Viscountess Bess uh, from Eldemir, Sarifkin from Ontier, uh, Duchess Vigdis from here in Artemisia, uh, Lady Catherine, who we all call Kate, uh, up in Avacal, and uh, Countess uh, Grenifar from uh, North Shield. Um, so we're very delighted to have them uh, and, to, and to have them all as, as part of this discussion. Uh, so I guess we'll just go in that order. Uh, Bess, would you like to introduce yourself? I am Elizabeth Mortimer. I'm from Eldemir. Part of the uh, joined Eldemir was part of the Middle Kingdom. I started fighting in 1987. I was knighted in 1996, and I won Principality Coronet in the same year. That's it. Hi, hey. I'm Rithkin. Um, I live in Ontier. Um, I started fighting in '97. I got knighted in 2003, um, and I haven't won anything with a royal title. Yet. Yet. We're working on that. And Vigdis. Hello, I am Duchess Vigdis. I'm from Artemisia. Um, I started fighting by helping train my husband and then I kind of got sucked in. Um, and I've been fighting since 2009 and I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kate? Hi, I'm Kate um, from Avacal. I'm squired to His Grace Duke Albrecht. Um, I've been fighting for, I hate putting numbers on it, but about 20 years. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> I think it's a good good topic to always discuss. And Gwen. Hi, um, I'm Countess Gwen uh, from North Shield. I've did some rapier combat when I first started, but I have been an armored combatant now for approximately 10 years. And I'm happy to be here. Right and I'm pretty sure you all know Branos. Uh, he'll be in and out throughout the conversation there. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to mention uh, starting off in this conversation was that, um, you know, this this is something that, it, that has come up uh, a few times recently. Um, uh, in particular, uh, there was a discussion on the um, uh, the DEI, uh, the SCA uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion webpage um, that, that happened just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you will likely be hearing some of the same stuff that, uh, that the Zara and uh, Wolverine had talked about um, and some different things as well. Um, there was also the Women of Chivalry uh, discussion that happened last year that uh, Sir Rifkin and uh, Sir Bess were both involved in. And, you know, we while those conversations have been had, um, we firmly believe that this is an ongoing conversation. This is something that, that we need to be able to, to, to talk about um, regularly. Um, I, I have tried really hard over the years to do what I can to, to normalize women in our sport. And, you know, one of the things that I had talked about in, in, in presenting this episode is, you know, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied with women being accepted in our sport. We need to do more to make our sport more inviting to women and to gender minorities. Um, and, and this is all gonna be kind of about how we can, how we can do that. Um, 
so that's the that's the gist of it um we've got uh, a bit of an outline uh to to go over so i think uh i think Bess was going to start with um i think Bess was going to lead us off thank you so one of the one of the things we want to discuss today is are women different and you will have seen and hopefully you will have seen or heard many discussions about the various ways women are or are perceived to be different. What we are looking for today is to provide suggestions to everybody watching on how, uh, if women are different, to use those differences or to bring women in. And I think the very fact that you might be saying to yourself, well, yes, women are different, is an indication, maybe not that women are different, but that people perceive women to be different. Often in discussions, you'll hear women, you'll hear conversations. Well, women like to do this, and women have a harder time doing that. Uh, certainly, not all, not all women. We're not all an average. So, when you see a woman come into your practices, possibly for the first time, I would like to suggest you don't think of her in terms of an average. That you actually look at her. And determine is she tall? Is she short? Is she wide? Does she look athletic? Is she like me, a little bit clumsy? Those are the things that you really need to be looking at when a woman is coming out to your practice. And again, not just a woman, any fighter, but it seems to be that we forget that we do this with male fighters when they first came up, come out or male participants when they first come out. And we only view these uh, with women, but it's important that we do this with everybody, not just the women. It will be important that you know that not just one answer will fit everybody um, and each person, male or female, but in this case, we're focusing on the female, uh, need to be treated differently. Women are generally, generally, as much as they don't like averages, treated uh, more gently uh, in society, and we need to get away from that. We are a full contact physical sport, and we have to be aware of that. There are a couple other things I, uh, to discuss, and I think that guess you were going to discuss um, a couple of the other, other items we, were, we have on our, our agenda. Um, I guess the first thing that we wanted to start off is some of the psychological differences that come into the sport as a woman. Um, something that I've always studied is, is how the brain works and how people emotionally react to things. Um, and it's very hard to turn that in on yourself and realize that you're part of that. And that's something that I had to do while setting up for this, because in all honesty, there was a point where I was like, why are we talking about this again? Okay, we've, we've hashed this out. It's done. Let's move on. But the truth is, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of questions that people have that to me are just part of normal existing. Um, and to, um, to men, they just don't seem to have that same um, environment. For example, I was asked, well, the women are the ones that need to stand up and speak mm -hmm. out and, you know, address these issues. And I said, okay, well, that's true, except for we've been addressing these issues since we were like five years old. I started on a, you know, a little league team. I was the only girl in the entire league. And that was an absolute nightmare. My mother fought for forever to get me on that league. Um, but you get used to it. You get used to being told that you need to be out in the field. You get used to being told that, um, you know, let the boys play. We'll include you kind of, <laughs> and you just kind of accept that and you move through it. And it happens all the time. Um, I was number one on my tennis team in high school. And um, my coach decided because she was very inclusive of everybody. She put me over on the, the men's side. And I cannot even tell you the amount of um, interesting comments I got from the boys because I was on the other side. Um, and it, it's just something that we tend to move through um, and we don't talk about it a whole lot because there comes a point where we get tired of fighting. So, well, okay, tired of fighting, but not on the field. Um, <laughs> so um, there are some psychological issues that come along with being a female and trying to enter a male sport. And most of it has to come with or uh, comes down to 
we're just trying to exist and not make waves because that's how we've been trained to enter these worlds. And the more waves we make, um, the more people tend to push back or I love this comment. My favorite is, um, you know, she's not feeling well or uh, she's just being emotional right now, <laughs> you know, so and that's not the case. We're actually trying to um, make a name for ourselves and, and, and participate and actually compete. Um, so I think when women first enter the field and, you know, there's a lot of other aspects that are going on emotionally that I think a lot of men don't um they don't do like that's that part of their interaction and that's just something that um you have to address we're not weaker we're just quieter because we've been trained to be quieter that's where i'll stop for now <laughs> yeah and, um so one of the things we were talking about in in this discussion is uh, and going along with that is you know i have for the longest time i have i have trained um women with with the idea that the, the biggest difference between men and women in, in the fighting field are more psychological and less physiological um and and that's something that that i've talked to a a number of women in our sport um uh, rifkin and vigdis and helga have all been huge sounding boards for me and trying to figure out how i can be a better advocate uh for women in our sport and um you know one of the things uh, that that I've kind of learned from that is uh, I, I tend to focus on training to body type rather than tra training to gender type. Um, and and I know uh, I know Gwen had some some comments on this from when she first started. So maybe I'll have her her jump in with you know some of the some of the misconceptions and ideas that you know that women are smaller, right, Gwen? Yep. Um, sure. Uh, my spouse and I started heavy fighting at approximately the same time. Um, we're exactly the same height at five foot nine, and I have a good 30 pounds on him. But the thing I ran into when I started fighting is people would, when they came to train me, would say the phrase, this is going to be harder for you because women are smaller. And they kept saying it on repeat without actually noticing me standing there or, and it was clearly not something that was said to my husband, um, who again, at this time I was bigger than him. So it was just a rhetoric and it sort of gets stuck in your brain then that this is gonna be harder for you. And it's gonna be harder for you, even though it's it wasn't a factual statement and it had nothing to do with what we were doing at that time. They just had it in their head that that's a thing they have to say. And they just went with the rhetoric. Right. So do you want me to talk about what isn't working now? <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this um, because most of what we're going to be talking about is how we can be better allies and how we can fix some of the stuff that, that we don't think is working now. Um, I think one of the biggest things that um, isn't working is the microaggressions, um, the the sexual ob objectification, um, sexist language, um, non-gender neutral language. Um, and, and I think maybe the hardest part of that is the microaggressions because it's unintentional um, discrimination. It's indirect, it's subtle. Um, and a lot of people don't even realize they're doing it. Um, you know, when you tell someone they fight good for a girl, that is um, a microaggression or you say to somebody else, don't hit like a girl. That's a microaggression. Um, other things that aren't really working, um, but that we've been working really hard on the last 10 years, um, like fight practices. My first 15 years of fight practice, there was no bathroom. Um, so after I had a baby, I couldn't go to that fight practice anymore. Um, women need a bathroom. We can't just pull it out and pee in the bushes. Um, so, uh, things like that where, where you don't think about it because it's not something you need, that's not your experience. Um, those are things that, um, work against us. Also, let's see, um, the lack of a training culture, um, for a very long time, the SCA was all about whether you could survive the gauntlet and nobody taught you how to block that shot. You just had to figure it out. 
Um, and also, you know, Duke Sean and Duke Brown also have been working really hard the last 10 years to change that as well. Um, let's see, a lack of loaner gear that um, is more for women's bodies. You know, Gwen's right. Um, I, I am not a small person, but there are parts of my body that are different. I have curvier thighs. I have um, a waist that bends higher than men. So a lot of times the loaner gear doesn't work. And so we'll talk about a lot of this um, on how to be better allies. Yeah, so um, so we have, as, as Vigdis had mentioned, um, you know, this is a conversation that comes up a lot. And we, in this particular episode, we didn't want to spend too much time uh, hammering on all of all of the what's wrong because I feel like a lot of that has been uh, we as, as she said we we've rehashed this a lot and so one of the things that we want to do with this particular episode is to focus on uh, some of the solutions and and how we uh, how we create that better environment and how we actively uh, do that again as I mentioned earlier it's it's not enough um, that that we are accepting of women in our sport. Uh, we need to be more inviting. Um, and one of the things we'd all talked about along these lines is some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about and the solutions that we have are um, the things, the things that work well and are encouraging for women and gender minorities, curiously enough, uh, also benefit men. Uh, I agree. Look, learning our sport as well. Um, and I was thinking Bronos might have some, uh, yeah, some thoughts I, on this kind of I'm posting in the comments about this. You know, I, I, I look back and, you know, I've, I've gotten a chance to, I, I know a number of these wonderful women here. I, I've had a chance to, to talk and work with them a lot. And, you know, over 30 years, I've trained dozens of, of women. And I look back now after, even after this one year of this actually just being talked about and communicated now. And I look back at how much, I, how much better I could have been a, a trainer just by knowing more of this. So I think, you know, the thing I posted in, in the comments was, you know, we have to communicate this. And, and right now it needs to be communicated by, by women um, because they're the closest to it. But in the future, this has to be communicated by everyone. And the, the more, not only women, but men and, and, and you know, non-gender, gender specific, what, however it gets communicated, it doesn't matter. And I, Sean, I think you're hundred percent right. Um, I look at this as an opportunity to create a better fight practice, to create a place where, you know, we look and it's like, okay, well, you're, you're thin. You, you probably need to, you know, we're, we're going to have to work on shot mechanics because you don't have as, as much, you know, as much weight or muscle mass. Uh, we're going to work on some, uh, you know, maybe some slam ball and we're going to work on some feet and we're, you're going to use that height and, and, and being faster to your advantage. And, and you notice all in all of that, none of this was men or women specific. The key is that we're trying to get to a place where, where we look and try to get people to be able to fight the best they can fight. And the thing that came out there to do is, is that that's, it's as simple as it gets. We have to, we, as good trainers and coaches, have to be better at recognizing how we can help people get there. And I think this is the conversation. And, and I'll apologize. I, you know, I, I, I did, I, I'm coming, coming on wrong. I had some knee surgery. And um, so I, I'm coming on a little late. Um, I also, I'm, I'm going to throw and And just because uh, you guys have worked so hard organizing stuff, I'm, I'm going to throw some, some kind of curveballs into you guys because I think people are looking for a session that is just like everyone, every one of these other sessions we have, right? I mean, and you guys really want that too. So, so along the way, I'm gonna throw some stuff out there. I want to make people comfortable. And this is a very uncomfortable subject. And the more we make it comfortable, I think the, the, the more we can try to work through it. So, um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the whole subject because this is gonna be all you know, I didn't get to live, go through this. So it's going to be a lot of good stuff. So, all right, off my soapbox. Yeah. Yeah, and that, and that was, uh, <laughs> that, you know, that was, that was something, you know, we've been doing the coach's corner for, for a year now. And, and we had given some consideration early on as to when we have this discussion and, and we honestly, we, we had intentionally put this off for a long time because uh, a lot of what we talk about as trainers is, is gender neutral. 
like, you know, range is not a gender specific concept, you know? Um, I mean, there's the, the only part of it that I think that is uh, really um, gender specific or can be is, is the, you know, stick mechanics perhaps. And even that is body, you know, that, that depends on body type. But a lot of what we talk about is how do we make people better trainers? Um, and I think some of the psychological stuff that we kind of mentioned earlier are some of the bigger variables that we need to account for um, in uh, in teaching women and creating a better environment for them. So um, so we got, um, we got a number of things we want to talk about and how to make things better. And one of those is uh, starting with language and how we talk about sport and how we talk to women and gender minorities in our sport. And I think we're going to have uh, Vigdis uh, start off on that. All right. Um, yes. So language is an, an interesting thing. People get very, I think, scared to say the wrong thing. And um, so they work really hard to not say anything. Um, and that causes a, a communication error as well. Um, if you refer to us as a woman, that's fine. We have no problem with that. You know, that we are women. That's, you know, that's uh, certainly something. However, uh, when you say, when something is said to the effect of, you know, they hit like a girl or, um, you know, anything that, that is derogatory towards women and, and we miss it too. Like people will say things like that and it blows right over our heads as well because we're used to hearing it. But it really does set a precedent um, that we are, we are weaker and we are inferior. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I actually got into a big fight with somebody about this um, because they had said, you know, they were making the joke about fight like a girl. And I said, I said, hey, I do fight like a girl. I am a girl regardless of how hard I hit you or how many shots or blows I get in, I'm fighting like a girl. I have no choice. I am a girl. Um, you know, you, you can't be a good mechanic as a girl. You just are a good mechanic or you're not. And it's the same with fighting. Um, so the language is important in order to understand that what you say can bring down or lift up you know, whoever you're talking to. Um, and I don't care if it's, you know, women or other minorities, uh, the way you speak um, about those minorities has a, a big impact. Um, one of the things that I do love about the trainers that I'm around and that has really helped me is that while I am still referred to as a woman on the field and that's fine, there's no animosity, there's no talking down to, there's no um, you know, treating me like I'm different. And that really helps me in my fighting. Cause then I can just focus on training. I'm not trying to prove anything to anybody because I'm just focusing on training. Um, so that's, that's where I'll start that. All right. We've got Kate with some thoughts on this as well. Okay. Um, when I, when I think about language, I think about effective communication. And part of that is not only as you're operating on the field um, as a fighter and communicating with your opponent, I also think of how to approach that as um, how I would want my trainer to approach it or how I would approach it if I were trying to teach someone. Um, and I think that um, effective communication, I think everyone could improve on that. And um, I think that we, we need to be open to the idea of learning more effective ways, whether you're the student or the teacher. Um, I know there have been instances in the past where some of the people who have been training me have been trying to get more information on how to be more effective with, uh, with training and they've been dismissed. And it's be primarily because they're male. And I think that we need to be open to the idea that um, anyone can be an ally. And when you're looking at training, um, yes, there are things in common among women, but there are as many differences as, as there are commonalities. And so looking at effective communication, who is the best person to communicate with the new fighter? So. All right. Uh, and then we, I think we have a uh, Rifkin. Yeah, I wanted to make two points. One, one point 
um, why gender neutral language is so important is because when you don't use it, you erase um, people, you make them invisible. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat in Knights Council and felt invisible because uh, consorts are always women um, and fighters are always men. And I, Milan, I saw you and I, I totally recognize that there's people that don't fit in the binary and I'm gonna do my best to um, say gender minority instead of women um, because that's important too. Um, and I am not good at that yet and I am working on it. So give me a little bit of grace. Um, but anyway, that's one of the reasons why language is so important. And then the, the flip of that is when people say a fighter is just a fighter, you're also erasing women because you're, you're discounting that or, or gender minorities, you're discounting gender minorities because you're discounting that their experience may be different or that um, that some of the things that they go through, you're, you're, you're taking that away from them, it's subtracting. Um, and I understand like that makes people afraid to talk, but it's super easy, fighter, consort. Um, there's a lot of language out there that we can use. And then the other thing that I wanted to say about language um, is more about communication. And I think Kate um, talked about that pretty good. Um, communication is so important. Um, I, I think if we could come out of anything from this, it's about um, actually talking to people, asking them what they need, being um, an advocate for yourself and communicating what you need, um, super important. So uh, I will talk about communication more later, but that, that's another part of language that um, is huge. Right. And then we had uh, Bess on this. So I'd like to go back to something that, that was mentioned earlier and nobody, <laughs> nobody has ever said why. You fight like a girl. Man, you hit like a little girl. You cry like a little girl. Well, first off, if you're in a training session, those are in, uh, insults or perceived insults. So why are you calling people out? And why are you doing it using gender? But the important thing is, as a trainer, you shouldn't be insulting or putting down the people that you're trying to lift up. You're trying to train these people to be better. And frankly, if somebody says to me, you're hitting like a little girl, that's not a lot of feedback that I can use other than I'm being insulted but I still don't know what to fix. So that's really not a helpful thing as far as training goes. So how about we just stop putting people down at training at practices when they're learning something, instead of saying, oh, you're throwing that, you know, oh, it's, it's weak. How about you say, you don't have sufficient power and here's the reason why. Or I'm watching you with that blow and it's not good. Unless I'm hitting you low because I'm hitting you as, because I'm the height of a two-year-old child, you ought not to be referencing it. So, so let's just kill that. And what Rifkin was saying earlier too about don't discount the fact that I'm a, whim, I'm a woman or that we are women. That's what Black Lives teaches us. Black Lives teaches us that when people of uh, non-color, white, <laughs> when I say to somebody, I don't, I don't see color, I am dismissing an entire lifetime that they've had to go through. I'm dismissing everything they've got. And if you don't see me as a woman, then you're dismissing everything that I have gone through. And that, that's something Rifkin was touching on. But I think it's super important. And I know that it's trying to get up to, up to nothing or up to being gender neutral. But the reality is there are differences. You know, I have been brought up not to hit or I have been brought up uh, not to make a fuss or maybe to ask questions afterwards because I really don't want to interrupt the session, things like that. So it's important to be aware of these things and, and to dismiss it by, I just see, you know, armor or I don't see boobs. Those are, those are important things to be cognizant of. So that, that was what I wanted to add to this. All right, so one of the next things that we wanted to talk about is, um, you know, when when people, when fighters, particularly men, um, are going to make comments that are derogatory to, uh, specifically to to women and gender minorities, and whether they intend to or not, um, uh, what are we what are we going to do about that? Um, and I think we're going to have uh, Gwen lead us off on this particular topic. All right. Um, sorry, I had a pop up. I think that 
fighters practice especially tends to devolve sometimes into situations where you have some inappropriate jokes or some of those kind of misogynistic phrases, microaggressions uh, that were brought up. But how they're handled is really important. Um, it's better to be an ally in a way that you amplify the person's voice who is having the problem. You know, if there's, it's a lot easier to just turn to your friend and say, God, that, that just wasn't a cool comment versus laughing at it in a way that, um, re you know, if you laugh at the joke, that reinforces to the marginalized gender fighter that you also agree that it's funny to you too. And that again, others them and puts them apart, but it doesn't have to be a big deal and you don't need to shift the focus away from what's going on to make it about you, um, about the male saving the situation. It's really just a dude, not cool. Um, and you know, one of the things that's come up before when it comes to like crass jokes at practice is that idea of you're not necessarily saving the female fighter or the gender minority fighter from it. It is totally okay for you as a male fighter to also be offended in that situation. Maybe you're not, you can choose to not be okay with jokes that belittle women or deciding that when all women are having a hard day, it's because they have their period or something. It's okay for you to just not be okay with that behavior and not make it specifically their issue. I think uh, Vig just had a comment on this too. I do. It's just a real quick anecdote um, on language, um, which is uh, when I very first started fighting, I had a serious problem with power, power generation. And one of the things Duke Sean teaches is isolation of the hips. And the problem is some people can actually isolate their hips like completely. And this was a problem we were having, but we couldn't figure out why it was a problem we were having. And it was because I was isolating my hips too much. It was just like, I was throwing my hip first and then the rest of the shot was coming off. So there was no power. Um, rather than, you know, having an issue as a girl, he, you know, he stepped back and he's looking at it and it's like, okay, what am I missing? You know, and started, we started analyzing video analyzation, all kinds of stuff. And then we realized what was going on, but this has been, <laughs> this is something I've talked to a lot of women about and they, a lot of women have said the same thing, which is, you know, the hip. So that is a difference where there's the hip isolation, um, where we can actually can completely isolate our hips. Um, so just from a training perspective, it's something else just to keep in mind that when you say hip isolation and we actually do it, <laughs> um, it's, you know, it can cause an, an interesting power issue. So just another thought on that. Yeah, I was I was at uh, Sport of Kings, or Sport of Kings, go if you can, a um, number of years ago, and uh, I remember I, I was talking to, I was teaching my class on estate mechanics, and there were some women in the in the group, and I mentioned the fact that, um, you know, I, I start with a position where you start with your feet shoulder width apart, and then you take a step forward with your shield foot, and for men, when you do that, the hips are... The, the hips are, are pronounced where the, the the one hip goes forward. And I mentioned that, and one of the women in the class said, no, my hips don't do that. And, you know, it was, I've been teaching this for a number of years at that point and just like had not, had not really keyed into the fact that, yeah, that, that hip isolation, when, when I rotate my hips, my, my hips move in, in one motion. And when women move their hips, they, they just move differently. And, um, and, and this is something else that I've considered just recently that I haven't really studied too much on. There may also be a difference in the hip set of women who have had children and who have not had children. So when you talk about how those hips function, um, the hip, hip rotation and the hip isolation and the way the hips are built are definitely something that is a physiological difference between men and women. But again, it's not, it, it, it's not insurmountable. It's not something where we have to treat it differently because of this thing. We just have to recognize 
that that is a thing and figure out how we can get the same type of hip rotation to uh, to to generate power. And that's something that working with with Vigdis and and a number of other women. And, and again, I've been teaching this class for a long time. Now I had a woman say, "My hips don't do that," and it totally changed how I teach my stick mechanics class. And that's one of the things that that I wanted to point out in this is, you know, listening listening to women turns out makes me a better trainer. Yay, you're right. We actually <laughs> listening to people, right? Yeah, listening to people, listening to my body doesn't do it that way. Yeah. And there's been a lot of people that I that I've uh, that have had you know physical ailments yep. that, you know, and a lot of them are short and a lot of times when I talk stick mechanics, one of the things that I do for people that are shorter is I will sit down on my knees and show them how the the hand works and and everybody laughs at this but i'm like this is what it looks like when you're a foot shorter than everybody this is what it looks like and this these are the the mechanics you're going to have to do and this is how your sword is going to have to work in order to in order to to get there and in fact vigdis's husband had his thumb crushed in a in a in a mechanical accident when he when he was working on on transmissions totally crushed he has what we refer to as the nubbin. Um, and his thumb doesn't function like a normal opposable thumb does. And that's something that I had to work with him to figure out how he's going to do that. We can do this with body types of, and, and it's not gender specific. So. Yeah, I think that, I think the key there is, you know, again, we got to look at what people need, not, you know, not what's, you'll come into this as what's, what's the matter with them what's all this the weaknesses it's like okay how do we work past these and work with them because to tell you the truth they probably already figured out a lot of this themselves and they can help you understand it and that's the key is let them listen and let them help you understand it and you know i, I think that goes a long way to really becoming a better coach you know it's, it's funny the hip mechanic thing we've totally i've seen that here uh, just lately, in fact, uh, in the last few years, um, the exact same thing. So, you know, by communicating things like this, and I think this was a great example, by communicating things like this, well, hopefully there's other people listening and are like, okay, well, I'm going to watch that next time somebody's throwing, you know, maybe they're throwing a little bit lighter in it. You know, again, you, they can watch and say, are, are the hips connected to the rest of the blow, right? And and if they're totally separate, all of a sudden they, they can, under, it's like, hey, I've heard of that. Let me see what I can do instead of, uh, I don't know, throw harder. Like it gets us, a, a, you know, it has to be the worst thing I've, I've ever heard. It's just like, well, uh, just throw harder. Well, that's not coaching. That's, that's, that's just, uh, uh, that's just words coming out of your mouth because you don't know what to say. So. Yeah, and, and that, that also is a non-gender uh, specific thing. You know, mm -hmm. just throw harder. And I, I was talking to there, there was actually a comment on the the coaches corner group the other day about somebody trying to like become a better trainer for their stick mechanics. And uh, you know, it's like uh, you know, one of the things that I pointed out was there's a lot of us, especially newer trainers, that uh, we kind of default to you throw like this, just do it like this, and not understanding that a lot of us that have been doing this for a while, you don't know what it's like to not know how to do this. And we have to be willing as trainers, regardless of gender of who we're teaching, we have to be, we have to listen to the student. We have to understand that they don't know what, what, what our, our body is known for 30 plus years. And we have to find a way to be stupid again and know, and, and to understand what it's like to not know how to do those things. Um, so Kate also had a, had some comments on this too. I'd like to let her go. Uh, yeah, just to, to draw back to um, calling out bad behavior um, it, that you may be witness to at a practice. Um, often having been in circumstances where I've been on the receiving end of, you know, not necessarily, come on baby, hit me like you mean it. Um, yeah. You hit like a girl. Um, things like that. Um, I was horrified and mortified and couldn't necessarily advocate for myself in the moment. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that I didn't want to advocate for myself going forward. And so sometimes it's with a conversation with the person who's been on the receiving end of those type of comments or those offensive comments of like, hey, I, I saw this happened. How can we help you address this on your own? Because often when you're, you're sparring, nobody is really paying attention what's to, to what's being said. And so how to, how to help them advocate for themselves um, in the future so that it's not just left of like, this was horrible. Yes, okay, it was, it was um, offensive behavior, but how do, how do you address it going forward? So um, I think helping people be able to take those steps on their own and empowering them to do that. So I just wanted to add that. Hey, Bess. So I'd like to do a little bit of a follow-up on something both Sean and Bronis had mentioned. Uh, Sean, you had mentioned that you didn't know about women's hips moving differently. And Bronis, you had mentioned that uh, if you just listen to some people, they'll tell you how to teach them because they've probably figured it out already. Yeah. And I'm going to use me as an example because I'm a really good, horrible example. Uh, I'm in a practice right now. I, I, it's every Sunday. And uh, we're learning some stuff. And I, I can't do it. I couldn't do it. For the life of me, I couldn't do it. We'd have instructions going on and we'd have people doing things slowly, but I, I couldn't figure it out. And I was, I could hear the words, but I couldn't translate them into a way that made it work for me. So I kind of, for the first couple of times, I kind of shut right down during the practice. I turned my video feed off. I couldn't focus. Uh, there may well have been tears of frustration, which I can neither confirm nor deny. And then I called a friend up afterwards who's in the class as well and said, look, I don't get it. And I think I'm really stupid. And I, and I, and I don't understand. Like, I'm a freaking nightmare. Why can't I understand these things? And the answer is because the classes are being taught in a way that doesn't work for me. And so what I've been doing now for the class is I wrote up, you know, a bunch of things for me that work. This is how we step and this is what we do. And uh, once I found out how the steps were going, then I could learn. This isn't how the class was being structured. And there's a bunch of us, so you can't just slow it down and teach it for, for one person who doesn't learn the way that the group does. But when the class is going on, then I can show people like, hey, look, I made this, this little graph for me because I feel like a dummy. Because uh, I wasn't learning and I was frustrated, man. I was really upset. And a friend of mine just said, when I was talking to him about this, said, write it down. Just, you can do this. I have faith in you. You're not, an, you know, you're not actually an idiot. Uh, and so I, I made my little flip charts for me for practice. But it take, for me, it took practice. And that made me frustrated too. Because everybody else seemed to get it right away. And I got mad at myself as if, Somehow it was like all the guys in the class, they weren't asking the questions. The guys weren't saying what's going on. There's a woman who's also helping with instruct, doing the instructions. So she's got it, but she's got guys helping her. So my own internal bias was that for me was that I couldn't do this because I don't know, I'm a woman and I couldn't figure out how, how the guys are doing it. So I'm, I'm calling out me on my own internal biases on that. The coach was asking for questions, but I was too shy. I didn't want to make a fuss. I didn't want to say anything at the time. I just I called my bothered. friend afterwards. I think the coach is really mean is the problem. <laughs> the coach is a great guy. He's trying hard. He just, he's doing, he's working for the group, not for the individual. That's all. Well, you know, you, you don't want to be a bother, right? And that's the God's honest truth, Sean. It's, it's one of those things that's happened. Don't make a fuss. If you don't get it, it's you. It's nobody else in the group. It's you, Bess. It's your issue. You haven't caught on. Although it, it turns out, I, I feel comfortable now sharing it because I've sh sh shared those in the class. I've shown them a couple of times and people have said, thank you. So it turns out, hey, it's not just me. It's not just my ovaries who don't know how to step right. It's, it's actually all of us. <laughs> Yeah, I love it.
Yeah. All right. Uh, Rifkin, you had something on this as well? Uh, yeah, actually, I wanted to talk about bad behavior, but you know, one, one of the things that Bess's story brings up is sort of um, something I'd like to talk about later about owning your experience. Um, and we're all products of our cultural upbringing and women are taught, at least in my generation, that we don't take up space, um, that we should be smaller. And um, I just want everyone to know you don't have to be smaller, you take up that space and best you ask your questions because I found those diagrams very, very helpful too. I actually took all the ones that Elf, Elf, Elfwin put together and I printed them out for myself. So, um, but I wanna talk about bad behavior um, calibration. Um, we, every kingdom has like their missing stairs of calibration. Um, the guys that are perpetual problems that nobody deals with. Um, we need to deal with those guys um, because when women and I know I'm not the only one, tell those guys, hey, I think you're missing my shots or, or gender minorities. Um, it, it immediately goes back on us that we're not hitting hard enough. And I know I'm hitting hard enough. I spent years learning how to hit hard enough. Um, and then we become the bad losers. Um, we become the people that can't hit hard enough. So I just, I wanna say, call out that bad behavior. Let's talk about calibration. Let's tell those guys this is not okay and not make it the person throwing's problem when we all know it's not their problem. Cool. All right, so the next section we had on this um, was uh, structure, structuring fighter practices and uh, making better coaches, which, uh, you know, I mean, that's the whole reason that the coaches corner exists. So this is, <laughs> seems like a good, good place to get started on this. And I think, uh, I think we had Gwen starting on that. Is that right? I can. All right. Uh, hang I'm happy to. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to touch on a couple of things that happened before we get to the coaching part. Um, where your practice is held and some of the stuff about it, um, Rifkin hit on this. So, you know, it's kind of that idea of thinking back to when you're a new fighter. And I know this experience is really different for the guys than typically gender minorities or other minorities who may feel unsafe, but, you know, you contact your local SCA group and you're given an, a name of a park somewhere and there's no other information. You aren't told where parking is. Is there gonna be a bathroom? Are there other people around? Or are we just gonna meet strangers in the park and just assume they're going to be good people? How far am I gonna to have to carry my stuff? Um, is it also a general social practice? Will there be families and other people there? How late is it going? Will it be dark at that point? Um, these are a lot of safety measures that typically males don't have to think about, but at the end of a two to three hour practice when I'm exhausted, I don't want to walk in the dark down a pathway, you know, half a mile to my car alone. It's not safe. It doesn't mean I'm going to want to come back to that practice. Um, just putting that extra information on your website or your Facebook that just lets people know without having to ask for it. Again, don't make it on to those people who need that information to have to essentially suck it up and ask for it, just, just give it out. Let us know all those details, um, give us contact information so that I could leave a name and a number, a modern name and a number with my partner when I'm gonna go travel to a practice so they know where I am and who I'm with. Um, that sets up a safety net that allows practice to work better because then the people coming don't have to think about those things. They can think about training. And that's kind of that next step is they don't want to have to worry about practice itself being safe. Yeah, and one of the things that we had on, on this uh, particular portion is, um, <clears throat> again, these, these are all things that um, while they are, while they disproportionately benefit women and gender minorities as, as training tools. Um, what we're finding, curiously enough, is these are also tools that help people in general. Um, and there are things like, for instance, um, you know, one of the things that, that Bronos and I have been trying to change for a long time is this idea 
of of pain as a teacher and you know if if you get hit in the leg long enough you're gonna you're gonna be able to finally start blocking these shots um that's not teaching you know that that's not actually educating people how to do a thing that's just assuming that they're going to you know put their stuff on and get hit enough until they figure it out and i know that's something i've been trying to change for a long time i know that's something that that bronos has been focusing on for a long time too is changing how we teach our sport because this idea that if you're just if you're just stronger and faster and have an athletic background then 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 that's what makes you successful um that just doesn't work um it is a terrible way to teach people how to fight um and so ending pain as a teacher um doing structured practices where we are doing uh, more drill oriented practices where we are taking the time to actually do the training we're teaching people how to do a thing um rather than just putting them in armor and, and hoping that it all that it all, it all works out um so Bess, I, I think you had something on this as well yeah so i asked um a bunch of my female fighter friends what would make fight practices better for them because you know i figured we may as well go to the audience and uh, I got some really practical advice. If you're got somebody coming to practice, in particular women, because we're we're targeting them at this conversation, but really it's anybody who's coming to practice, say thank you for coming, or I'm glad that you're here. If they're you know if they're from out of town, you can put your armor over here as a place. The bathrooms are down the hall through the doors. Just sort of giving them the layout of the land, which is good. For people who have been in the SCA for a couple of years, and maybe now they're thinking, I'd like to try fight practice. If they come to fight practice with an SCA background knowledge, and now they like they show up and like, oh my God, there's Duke Bronis, or there's Duke Edward, or there's Duke Sean at practice. Uh, they may be shy, even if they've seen you here on Coach's Corner, or maybe if they're taking classes with you, they might be shy to go up and say hello to you, but you just looking up and smiling and saying hello hello to them will um, make them feel welcome. And again, I'm using myself as a very good, terrible example. When I go to fight practice, I'm focused on fighting. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm there, I, my armor goes here, I'm getting changed, you know, I say hi to my friends, but really I want to start fighting. I don't take the time to say hello to the new people that are coming out. I'm doing something, I'm one of those people because I'm a knight, I'm one of those people that should be saying, hi, come on in. So you're trying this for the first time, or what do you think? Or how do you like this? So one of the things I need to take away is to remember just to say, thank you for coming. And I'm glad that you're here. And would you like to fight? Or what are you working on tonight? How can I help you? And that, that makes me a better person for female fighters, for anybody coming up, and hopefully it'll make me a better person because, you know, I'll be nicer because that's really important too. fight practice should be a friendly and a, and a nice place. That's all. So, you know, I, I almost forgot everything I was going to say because I just like listening best, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I, Sean kind of nailed it. I, it. It's easy. I mean, you know, we might think you're, you might think you're a great trainer because you have, you, you grab every person that comes out that has a looks like has a sporting background or or something like that and and you give them enough to be okay in fact even push up into that that higher area um maybe you know maybe you even give them enough to be a knight um because he has that he or she has that physical background of competition of understanding how to be struck, uh, striking others, because that's a scary thing to strike somebody else. Um, you know, they have all of these things and they have years of understanding how to be a better athlete. Um, but I wanna point out that, you know, we, we, we talk about this and we have a whole library of drills and things like that that we do. And, you know, those are there because it's, if, if we're just going after those people, you're eliminating 90% of the other people. There are so many other people that want to participate in this. 
And not only are you doing that, but you may be missing some of the best. You know, I know lots of top guys. And when I say top guys, I mean, you know, when uh, I'll, I'll give you an example, Ron Felder had some background in sports, but he's not super, you know, sport guy. Right. Um, and, you know, but he built stuff. We trained and we built and we trained and we built. And he's top guy, top one of the top guys in the society for years, decades. All right. He didn't come out because, hey, look at I'm a super sports person. He came out and he learned and built what he does. And we could do that for lots of people. I'm a big believer in what happens with these people that have a lot of natural ability is they will always rely on that natural ability. In other words, you get them to win 70% of the time and lose 30. And I use this all the time. So you get them to 70, 30 with natural ability. And to get them moving past that is very difficult because as soon as they start going down to 60, they want to get back to their 70 and they know how to do it. So they're just going to rely on their natural ability and, and throw out any training you give them. Where you find somebody that's 30, 70, and they're consistent. You know, you know they beat those 30% because they know how. And now they're working on that 70, and they keep adding things. And they just keep adding and adding and adding. And soon, soon these people are like 70, 80, 90%, and understand how to learn. And those are the people, lots of those people, we are missing out on. Because we don't understand how to train them right. And we don't give them pot of positive motivation. We don't give them drills they can do and build. We don't give them, you know, exercises that, that could help their power and burst and things like that. We can do that now. So, you know, it, it, we, we talk about that. There's tons of drills out there, not only in our sport, but you pull from almost any sport. And that, you know, we, we got to do that better. And, and we will end up having a better society and, and a better, you know, a better group of fighters and, and, and better communication and how to help people enjoy our sport. And we need that. So, um, and the best part is um, anybody can do it. It, it. You just have to give them the opportunity. And I think that opportunity is what we're talking about right now. All right. Well, I think uh, uh, Vic just had a couple more thoughts on this. Um, I just had a, a quick note. Is something that when we started talking about language, I can't believe I forgot. Body language is huge. Um, when you show up to a, a practice and you look around and everybody just kind of stares at you and then looks away, you're like, okay, I'm going to leave. <laughs> um, body language is, is absolutely vital to not only keeping new people, but to training. Um, if, you know, just as a situation that happened, um, I was in armor, everybody was out fighting. There was one guy off on the side that wasn't fighting. So I walked up and said, Hey, would you like to fight? He literally looked over my shoulder, looked around and went, um, yeah. And I was like, okay, no, <laughs> you know? And so I, I walked away. So that, that body language told me that he had absolutely no interest in actually fighting me. Go away, please. Um, and what, <laughs> That one's got to get his chips. <laughs> that just happened. Hey, yeah. chips are important. <laughs> just stole my popcorn. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, body language. Yes. Yeah, so body language is, is very, very important, um, especially when you're training. So on the training level, if you are looking somebody in the eye and you are listening to what they say, they're going to feel like they're actually learning something. They're going to feel like you're interested in them learning. If you, you know, aren't really paying attention, you're looking away, you're saying, huh, a lot. Um, it's very obvious you don't care. And so we're just going to move on and go do something else or, or go stand in the background. Cause that happens too. I see a lot of people that'll just kind of go, okay, well, I'll just do my thing, you know? And so that's, um, it, it, body language is vital. Absolutely vital. So uh, in the next session here, we're going to have uh, Rifkin lead us off on uh, talking about the uh, council. Um, so I actually did take notes for this one. Um, sorry. Um, but well, I'm sure uh, you got something to say. Yeah. 
Yeah, I do. Sorry, the the <laughs> Zoom was telling me I was muted. I'm like, I'm not muted. Um, yeah, I in in council, I there there are a couple of things that I would like to talk about. One is that it's really really important that we remember language, um, and also that um, when we when we look at candidates, we look at the candidate as the candidate, and while you can't divorce of a, a gender minority fighter from their gender or their non-binary um, uh, affiliation. Um, you, you don't compare um, women to women. Um, it's, it's fighter and whether you're a knight. And I, I think sometimes like pe people worry that either women and gender minorities are held to a higher bar or a lower bar. Um, I, I just wanted to sort of clarify there is no bar. Um, there is a scale and everybody has their own scale. Um, you have to meet a minimum requirement in prowess to get on the scale. But once you get on the scale, it's a whole bunch of different things get weighed and it's not about um, a bar to knighthood. So if, if we could stop comparing ourselves um, to other people that have the same biology, um, about where we are and what we think we deserve, um, I think we would go um, a long way further um, to not actually doing harm to ourselves. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll throw something out along those lines too. Um, Vigdis, who is with us, is, uh, is my squire. And, um, you know, I, I have very high standards in, in our council for, for my squires. And uh, I, I, I am hard on her, um, not because she's a woman, but because she's my squire. And when the time comes that she brought, gets brought up in our Knights Council as to whether or not we want to add her to the order, um, I really don't want to hear people talking about how she's the best female unbelted fighter that we have. If we're not talking about her as if she's the best unbelted fighter that we have, regardless of gender, I'm not going to have that conversation. And, 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 and part of our agreement is that, you know, she is not going to be accepted into the order. She's going to be demanded into the order. I have great confidence and faith that she's doing the work that she needs to do to, to meet that standard. Um, but that, that's the standard that we've agreed upon. And when, when people start looking at me at, at one point and say, well, you're just holding her back because she's a girl. Like, no, I'm holding her back because she's my squire and she hasn't met the, the standard that, that we've agreed upon. And that's kind of what, what Rifkin was talking about is, you know, we, we, need to, we need to stop looking at women candidates for our order as, as being the best female fire, fight, fighter in the kingdom and just whether or not they're the best unbelted fighter in the kingdom or at least among them. Because um, it's not always true that the best fighter ends up being the next knight. Um, the best fighter, you know, may look like a total schlub, you know, with, you know, you know, 90s era, you know, SCA chic fighting attire. Um, we're, we're not going to knight that guy either. And, you know, so we, yeah, we do, we need to, like, like I said, it's not a bar, it's a scale. Um, and everybody has their, their different interpretations of, of what is good enough. Um, so we need to take that into consideration. So, Sean, do you have somebody else going to talk? Because I, I would like to relay a story. Um, I kind of lived that with somebody. Um, sure, go ahead. And uh, Sir Jocelyn, um, I, I was lucky enough that she was out of our practice. And she, she came from the west side of the state to our practice uh, early off. And um, she was super energetic. Um, just loved, loved, loved fighting. And... You know, there was lots of opportunity for me to learn with her. Um, uh, and probably the first thing I learned early off was, uh, you know, the, the reaction to frustration in women was much different for her, even though I had never seen it in my life with her before, was much different than a man's getting mad reaction. And for me, that didn't bother me too much because I came out of martial arts. So I was fighting her, you start getting tears. And then, you know, the first thing that happens is you want to make them feel better. And that's probably one of the worst things you can do. 
what you ask them is, would they like to continue? Right? So literally I'm like standing in front of her like, you okay? You ready to go? She's like, one second. Okay. And, and we just went. You ignore it and you move on. They work right through it every time. If they get to that point where they're so frustrated, they say, it's okay to stop anytime you get to a point where you think that you're, that, that you're just so frustrated it's not working anymore. And then a couple of things you can do there is say, when, you, when, when, you, that, when you're okay, just come on back, we'll continue up. Or, you know, hey, do you just wanna go back to, if you're in the middle of a lesson, drop back down into that lesson where they're doing something they know how to do well, to pull that back out. And this is not only for someone that's crying in this case, but also for somebody that's frustrated and physically angry in a different case. You can do the same technique with both of them. Second piece was, I stood up in a meeting and I said to the order, that I will tell them when she was ready. She probably could have been a night, some period of time before, before that point. Unfortunately, it also hurt other squires I had because then people were waiting as well for me to tell them they were ready as well. But I'm okay with that because the I'm gonna the worst thing you could do, and I'm sure sure you ladies would agree, is give you something that you don't think you earned, and it's not only you know it, it's no different for anybody don't give something to someone that don't think they earn hey that guy's uh he's he's late or mid 50s uh, he's just not he, if we don't do it now he'll never do it man you are you you are setting him up for failure and don't set up people like that so you know just be aware we judge people even equally and we have to be careful of judging everybody too hard on a on a level that is much higher than what this standard should be and i'll be the first one to be called out on that and i used to be like i'm the standard until somebody's like um your highness you're not the standard <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> oh, okay you win <laughs> So, so be careful and, and make sure that you're not judging people at a level that you think you're the standard because you may not be. And maybe you need to talk to others and really get past that. So um, just a warning. And by the way, for, for folks out there, uh, I still, still see Sir Jazzy all the time. She still comes to practice. She still fights. And she came in second in mid-round crown, not shortly after she got knighted. So uh, an amazing woman as well. So tell her I said hi. I sure will. So, uh, so we had a question that came up in the uh, in the comments. So it said, uh, as a female fighter, when I approach someone training and they are having a problem, I offer to help. More often than not, I am ignored. Very frustrating. Are there ideas on how to approach someone? And this was something that came up a lot in our discussions in doing this. And I think Vig just wanted to to start off on this. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll touch on it real quick. Um, for me personally, I run into this a lot, um, regardless of how you're, you know, especially if you're sparring with somebody, regardless of how your fights go, they want to tell you everything you did wrong, um, which is obviously my favorite. Um, and I have offered, you know, suggestions on stance and shot mechanics and things like that and been completely blown off. It is very, very frustrating, especially when, um, they go to like, say Duke Sean will come over and literally say the exact same thing I said. And they're like, oh, that's amazing. Yes. And I'm going, what? I just, I just said that. Um, so yes, it is very, very frustrating. The, the advice I would give honestly is focus on you. Um, if people aren't willing to learn from you, they're not going to, um, but don't be afraid to approach them. Um, you know, if you're, if you see something wrong and you want, that's nightly, you know, if you see something and you want to go and, and try to assist them, do it. Um, if they blow you off, that's their loss. And that's kind of, that's the stance I take, um, so that I don't get as frustrated, um, because it can be, it, it can be, um, I don't want to say debilitating, but it can certainly bring you down when people don't listen. Um, but also know 
it happens across the board. I've seen, I've seen Dukes walk up to, you know, some, somebody who's fairly new, not even squired and say, Hey, you know, I saw you doing this. This is something that, that could help you with that. And they go, Oh, well, I was doing this thing. And you're like, Oh, all right, well, <laughs> I guess we're done. So it does happen to everybody. Um, and, um, yeah, I would just, just focus on what you're doing and, and how you're doing it and you should be fine. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of throw something in here. Um, <clears throat> Vig just ended up becoming my squire because her husband was squired to me as well. And when I started working with him, I would talk words and stuff, and he would nod politely and then go home and look at his, look at Vigdis and say, "What the hell is he talking about?" And you know, then she's like, "Oh, it means this, this, and this." And then she would, in, in, she would speak the nubbin, and and then he would go on and become successful with the thing. At which point, you know, there, at some point, she just realizes, "Well, I'm already doing this thing, so I might as well just fight," right? Um, Vigdis is is somebody that has for since her first introduction to fighting, she has had an uncanny ability to translate in that way. Um, I often say that that her uh, comprehension exceeds her application. There's there's a lot of she has a much greater understanding of what things how things work and why they work uh, than necessarily she may or may not be able to do for herself. Um, and recently, in some of our local practices, we have had one of our one of our unbelted fighters who has kind of taken to her as a as a trainer, and um, you know she just she speaks a language that that connects well with this gentleman and our response with that and our within our household was that's her student and we are here for her if she needs us um but for the most part we're just going to let like she's already doing that job so we're going to let her do that job and that is something that we as men and as trainers in our sport can do when we see that 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 relationship happens um, we need to encourage that more. Uh, we talked about this a little bit in the in our last uh, our episode last week on the training vacuum, and that's something that that we've been talking amongst uh, the coaches in the coaches' corner recently about. Uh, we need to be de demystifying this idea that there is a certain pedigree that is required for somebody to teach a thing, right? If if you're comfortable teaching a thing, we need to encourage that. We need to get people like that's the whole point of this is getting people to be better trainers and encouraging that and we can do that regardless of gender but certainly when when we see it uh representation matters when we see women that are stepping up to take that role we need to encourage that and i think this is where we're gonna let rifkin lead in with that yeah um it, it's actually kind of funny to me because i think the person that asked the question is viscountess gwyn who uh is a master of arms and uh one drakenwald coronet by right of arms so um definitely somebody that maybe you should listen to. Um, but one of the things that, that I think is sort of interesting is, is why there aren't more women trainers. And one of the reasons um, is that women, women have been undermined um, when, they're, they, when they've been teaching for years. Um, anytime, um, even with my white belt on that I'm teaching, I'm, I always get interrupted. Um, even when we tell um, the nice Duke that, that we don't need any help, I still get interrupted. Um, so one of the things that, that people can do to help women, um, want to teach because it's hard to want to teach when you've been undermined for decades, um, is to validate that they have something to say and not to interrupt them, um, and to ask them to teach things that aren't just gender related and they don't, and not just ask them to teach your female students. Um, ask them to teach all your students. Um, women aren't exclusively um, women trainers. So um, that's one of it. And then another thing is I think some of the women that you would think would be trainers feel like they haven't earned it um, because they haven't won a, a crown tourney or a cornet tourney. And I think, you know, that's something that um, we, um, some of the more successful women fighters need to get over ourselves and just step up because that isn't, winning a crown isn't um, 
the the bar about whether you can teach or whether you're a good trainer. There's lots of Dukes who don't understand what they're doing. Um, great fighters, but don't understand what they're doing. Um, and as the other thing I want to talk about um, was that there's a tension between tokenism and representation. And you, there, you want representation in training, but you don't want to just ask um, a gender minority or woman to have a woman on the panel. Um, make sure that, that you are asking because you think um, they have something to offer, that they're an authority on the subject. Um, and, I, and I think that will make some people feel less like you're adding them as a token. Because I think that is actually a really um, big problem right now with some of the more successful um, women fighters about why they're not stepping up um, so that's what I have to say. Yeah, and, and, and again, as I was mentioning recently, or just a minute ago, that, that we're trying to, trying to demystify that and we're trying to get people over the idea that you, that you have to have a certain level of credential to, to be able to teach. Um, I mean, obviously we don't want just anybody teaching just whatever their, whatever nonsense comes in their, into their head, but, you know, teach what you are comfortable teaching um, and, and one of the things that, that we discussed in, in, in putting this episode together is the idea that um, uh, personally, I, I, I would like to see more women becoming trainers and teaching more, um, but we really need to put an end to women teaching women stuff. Like, let's have her teach stick mechanics for women. Um, you know, let's, you know, you're not going to teach range for women. You're not going to teach, you know, uh, uh, shot selection for women. Um, you know, so let's, let's stop talking about these concepts and, and encouraging women and gender minorities to teach more um, because representation matters. It really does. Um, I, I know there, there is the, the concept too, that uh, there are, there are a lot of women knights who consider that they were taught by men and so those are things that that work for you but um yeah representation matters and i can't say that enough uh you know to have you know when when we see women teaching our sport um it it promotes the idea that women are capable of teaching our sport and that was kind of the whole purpose of this episode was you know women are here right Let's let's stop accept, accepting it, <clears throat> and, let's and we're stop. not leaving. Just FYI, <laughs> we're not yeah. going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, let's let's. Hey, stop. hey, Sean, I'm going to throw something out because it got yeah. thrown out in our in our 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 notes here, and I'm going to throw Bess under the. She knows what I'm going to say. She's over here. <laughs> I can see her laughing, and uh, she's like, "Hey, why isn't there any uh, any female coach in Coach's Corner?" And I love doing this, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm the first. I, I love pointing back at ourselves and saying, "Hey, we're not perfect either." So one thing I, I, I posted back. I, it, it was funny. I, I just brought this up to uh, um, uh, to Sean today. Uh, one, I tell you, one issue is uh, we look at some of the the women that we we see as really good coaches and trainers and things, and they're doing a lot of stuff. It, it's been interesting. They're on other you know, other channels are helping people get through this stuff. They, they're, you know, so they've been super busy. I mean, we, we, it, we definitely have included women coaches in ours, uh, you know, uh, in our episodes. Um, but if you look at them, they're all, you know, a lot of them are already doing like other things. And uh, we, we talked to a few that already have stuff going on those nights. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely something that, um, that we know uh, we would like that. Um, because it spreads that across. It, it allows people to be more comfortable. You know, I, I don't necessarily want to be a show that just, you know, you come here, it's like, oh, a bunch of stick jocks talking and, and, and not really sharing. I, I would hope that's not the place um, because, you know, we've included, we've included non-belted people in the past in shows and things like that as well. And, uh, um, but I, I, for one, and I know Sean too, uh, would love uh, and enjoy when we do have uh, women coaches on with us talking because they really do help the show a lot. So, Bass, stop calling me out. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, we, we, we definitely have given some consideration of that. And some of that is uh, capacity. Um, we, we've actually uh, asked one or two and um, they just haven't been able to have the time. And uh, so that, but that's, that's something that uh, we, we try to, we're, we're going to try to do more of for sure. Um, so, uh, so we're about, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of getting close to wrapping up here, um, but um, I definitely wanted to, before we do full wrap up here, um, one of the things that, that Rifkin had suggested um, was, was to have some of our unbelted women uh, on the panel tonight, uh, kind of to give us an idea about some of the things that are working and some of the things that, that maybe we need to be uh, doing better. Uh, so a little more contemporary accounts. Um, you know, Rifkin's been a night for 18 years, Bess has been a night for, for that and some. And uh, some of their experiences as far as, you know, trying to slog through the, the, the malaise of uh, a male dominated sport, uh, maybe, maybe somewhat, uh, somewhat dated, perhaps. Um, and uh, so I wanted to uh, get some input from the unbelted women that we have on tonight as to uh, what's working and what we need to do better. So uh, maybe we'll start with Vigdis on that. Um, what's what works for me best is um, I am very lucky to live in the, the area that I do and have the trainers that I have because they actually listen to me. And I think that's the, the biggest thing is when I go to them and I say, look, I'm having this problem, you know, and I can't figure out how to fix it. They'll, they'll stand back, they'll watch and they'll say, okay, well, this is what I think is going on. And they help train me through it. Um, and there's no, you know, there's, there's no weirdness. It's like, just treat me like, I'm a fighter and, and that is, you know, that's going to help me be confident in what I'm doing. Um, and it's going to give me the confidence to come to you and ask you, Hey, what are you seeing and whatnot? Because we got a lot of heavy, heavy fighters. I mean, um, high level fighters at our practice. And sometimes it's a little daunting to, to go up and, and interrupt. Um, and I always feel like I'm interrupting and I try not to, but that's just part of it, I guess. Um, you're kind of bossy too so i i am a little bossy just just a little bit um but uh no being listened to is the biggest thing for me um and i am i'm very happy to say i've been to several kingdoms and you know i haven't had a whole lot of problems with with uh people listening when i ask them questions so okay all right kate how's things going for you um i feel in oh okay uh, sorry, I'm just, it came up that I'm <laughs> muted, but there we go. Um, I feel really fortunate in my circumstances. Um, Avocal is fairly spread out, but um, so, so traveling around has, has been kind of part of our culture, even as part of Ontier. Um, and my night actually lives three hours away but it's not unusual for me to travel north in order to get training one-on-one -on -one training even um with with my night um and the element of being listened to but i i think it it kind of works i'm fortunate in that it works both ways um he's working to better and more effectively communicate with me and the same um from my perspective, because I came, I came into um, armored combat as someone who played team sports, who was socially conditioned to not occupy space. And, um, and when I first started fighting, I would try to host my opponent on the Eric, feeling as though they had a greater sense of entitlement to the fight and to being there than I did, that I was, I was, um, I was being indulged and often I would be the only woman in the list. And um, now I don't even pay attention to genders in, in the list. And I think that Avakel's doing very well in the sense of, um, I think we do really well in encouraging women to fight. Um, it's getting them to stay in the sport and to take it seriously that I think that um, we, can, we can all do better at that um, with respect to retention. Um, I, I feel like it's all individual. Um, 
each and every one needs to take ownership of their own experience and their own baggage and their own obstacles and find the right voice and the right coach and the right teacher to work through if you want to be successful in this. Um, the way you learn, different learning styles, different teaching styles. Um, are you a kinetic learner? It, it may not be like I've, I've heard a lot of the, and I, I do this, and we have a, a woman night in our, our local area. I like to throw her under the bus as the, okay, if they want a woman to go and teach the new woman fighter, that, that would be you because you're recognized successful. <laughs> um, that isn't, and I understand the frustration of that where they're probably not the best person to go talk to that new person. And so I think we need to be a little more um, inclusive in our thinking as well, in that it doesn't have to be, um, you know, a successful female fighter going to talk to the new female fighter. I also think that it shouldn't be the rabid single guy who's always on the new people, <laughs> which, which can, can be detrimental too, but that's managing your, your practices culture, right? But um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I really like the fact that we're having these conversations and, um, and everybody gets new ideas based on different perspectives. And so what's, what works for one culture may not necessarily work for another culture. Um, and so adapting it to what might work for your, your area to help encourage, but yeah, but ownership. Once I, I, I've, I've, I said at the beginning, I, I've fought for close to 20 years, but it's only in the last, I would say five years that I've taken ownership of my journey. So um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> All right, Gwen. Um, let's see, I, I have a lot going for me where I'm at. Um, we have a really, mixed practice. We're usually 50-50 male and gender minorities, which is really nice. We've talked a lot about these issues and um, we've gotten to the point where a lot of people understand what's going on. But I think the biggest thing for me, and I'm going to borrow a phrase from a friend of mine, um, is the idea of according me the respect of shop talk, uh, which is a conversation that's come up before where it gives you that sense of inclusion um, you know, if everyone's hang, you know, hanging around and trying to figure out why someone's boss of bonds don't fit or whatever, that idea of asking everyone involved or having people come and ask me for an opinion on something. I've been around long enough. Um, one of the things I've learned is my recognition, um, I'm a Laurel, my recognition in art really had no translation to the respect on the heavy fighting field. I had to earn that from scrap. And that's fine, but there are times that my experiences do have a little more translation between the two arts. And when it, when those moments came where I was included in conversation, when people made eye contact when they talked to me, when someone expressly asked me to teach something, really changed my desire to stay in the heavy community. Those really simple things that I think are sometimes taken for granted made a world of difference in my experience. Um, and the slightly controversial thing I'd like to say about what isn't always working is I'm hoping that while these conversations are really important that they stop being the thing, the only thing I get to talk about at events. Um, I am happy to on some level take that on because um, I am a peer. I'm willing to have conversations. I'm willing to sacrifice some of my time so that some of our newer uh, marginalized gender fighters have that opportunity to fight at events. But maybe not every event, every time and with new people and going over the same thing over and over again because I'm there to fight. That's why I traveled to that event. I'd like the time to train um, but there's a lot of other resources. Talk to some of the male knights that we've already talked to, the ones who are being allies actively. They can give you the same perspective that I can, and it doesn't take away from the fact that it's interrupting my training time to explain to you again a concept 
that isn't that hard to find. So do your own work to help us um, or catch me offline. Catch me, you know, at a time where I didn't travel to an event solely to fight. Cool. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I, I think it's super important that we hear from, from people um, that are coming through the ranks now because it, you're you're the people in the gutters um you know or i that's probably not the best analogy but um i just trenches the trenches the trenches thank you <laughs> um, so no, I just, i'm i'm in the gutter they're in the trenches it's totally that's different true. yeah totally um, different so i just think it's super important that we listen to that and um we make space um for the needs of the people that are coming because you're our future um there there are two points i wanted to make i, I nobody is asking women to change the culture. I just want to get that our gender minorities. Um, we need men agitators in places of power that are willing to do the work. We're willing to help you and guide you, but that's who needs to like, it needs to come top down. Um, it won't work any other way. So we really appreciate um, both Branos and Sean for hosting this and for giving us a voice. Um, and for, you know, all the efforts they've made over the last decade or more than a decade and changing the fighting culture. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to briefly touch on is um, that women need to be better um, allies to other women. Um, empowered women empower women. Um, we are not each other's um, competition. Um, you don't need someone else's success doesn't diminish yours. Um, we need to stop. Um, treating each other like the enemy. Um, we have work to do there. Um, and I would love to help do that work because I think it's super important and fighting is so much more fun when you have, um, when you have lots of friends that have like-minded or like experiences with you. Um, this last year has been amazing for me because I have at least a dozen new um, friends in the chivalry and they're all women. Um, it's been amazing. Um, so let's let's get better about that too. Um, just because somebody else's experience isn't yours doesn't make it not valid. Um, I'm going to do a better job about um, participating in women's only turnings, even though it's not my thing. I am if if that helps somebody else, I'm 100% behind supporting whatever helps you. So um, I'm an ally too. Um, you can always reach me on on Messenger, Misty Edmondson. Um, so that's that's about all I wanted to say. I have a few things to say too. And uh, Misty, I think you kind of hit the big one is that um, we need to help each other out where we can and when we can, because representation matters and being helpful matters with each other. No one person, no one woman can be everything or gender minority can be everything. Representation matters, but you can't be the marshal and the trainer and do the demos and do your fighting and be the general, hey, there's a chick fighter question I gotta ask um, person. You can only do what you can do or you'll burn out and you won't be there. So it's important to uh, take responsibility for yourself to be able to create your own barriers and to say, or boundaries, not barriers, boundaries to say, I will help, but also I cannot be all things to everybody all the time. Um, that was something Misty helped me learn in a big conversation we all had recently. The other thing I can tell you being, you know, one of the, one of the old fighters, is things are getting better. It may not seem like it. And um, people might feel like, God, you know, how long have there been female fighters and are there still these issues? But I can promise you, promise you, things are so much better now. We're here and we're talking about it. People don't think it's weird that, you know, I'm in the change room and I'm getting into armor. I'm not the only one on the field. I'm not the only female on the field. I have friends here who want to help. Uh, I'm at gesturing to Sean and to Broadness, although that's where they sit in my gallery. They're here. They're supporting us. People are supporting female fighters. And I can't emphasize enough for all that people might remember from the bad, the old days or, you know, the bad days. Things are better now. Let the let the past be in the past and let's go forward because that's where we have to go. We have to go forward and leave the past alone. 
And I would say that for anybody that's wondering, well, you know, you want to do all this and like, so you want like an easy, cheap way to get awards? No, no, we're not asking for that. What we're saying is, to paraphrase my friend, uh, Sir Kelwin, she said, we're asking for a path to be open to the table so that I can walk freely to the table the way the male fighters can walk to the tables. That's all we want is an equal chance so that the the opportunities are there for us. And uh, I think that's all that we're asking for. And that's what I have to say on that. Final thoughts, Bronos? Yeah, so I, there's a couple of notes I took. And the first thing I would like to say is, um, I, I, I know some people, this is a hard topic and, and I'm gonna be you know, straightforward. It's not, there are, there are people, um, specifically men, that it, it's sometimes hard to comment in these, these forums. Even when I first started, I worry about what I'm gonna say. Um, I'm a bit older, so it, it's difficult for me to come up with gender neutral stuff and, and, and all of that kind of things, because it's just, it's 50 some years of, of doing it one way. And as you get older, it takes a little time to, to get it. It's okay. All you have to do is say, sorry, and move on. And they will understand that. Um, and, and, and I'm going to make mistakes. I do all the time. I apologize to my squire all the time when I do. And, and that's okay too, right? And because it's own your mistake. So that's just a point to the guys out there. I mean, I, I'm, I, I totally understand where you are. Uh, I'm a terrible writer, so I'm always afraid of writing something down, but I'm here in the comments because to tell you the truth, at the beginning of the show, there was a lot of men that didn't want to comment. I got a couple of things. It's like, I don't want to say anything here because I'm a little afraid. But if we keep that mentality, you know, we, we don't have to be, you're going to get called out if you're an ass. Um, but if we keep the mentality and we can't talk, then we're not helping the situation either. So just be aware of that. Um, for Kate, uh, she brought up something that struck home real quick, and that is because I had two people comment to me, again, outside the comments, is we cannot tone down the fight for women or non-gender or whatever. We cannot tone down the fight because you're doing a disservice to them, and you are just looking like an ass. And I am not going to you know, this is a real, this is a real point to me. And I do this, I'll do this when I go training places. And it's not just for women fighters. This is for everyone. We have to understand when, hey, we are training, communicate that. And it's okay to tone a fight down because it's training. But when, when you have to say, this is going to be three crown fights. And if you can hit that person three times in the exact same spot, then do it. Because you learn how to you learn how to turn it on, and the day they block that shot, they are a victim, right? There they win because now they know how to block that shot, and they believe it, and they can and they can work through it, right? So be careful of that. At, at I'll go to training sessions. I'll grab the knights, put them on one side. I'll grab the unbelts, put them on the other side. I'll talk to the unbelt. I'll, I'll talk to the knights first and say, "Hey, do you guys at practice tone it down when you go fight people?" And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We try to make sure everybody's having fun. And then I go over to the unbelts. I go, hey, you guys know that those guys tone it down when they fight you? And they're all pissed off, <laughs> right? So if you want to know how somebody feels, next time, come out. And if you tone it down for a woman, I'll tone it down for you. And, and then you get to learn how that feels when somebody has to tone it down. Because it is not good for anybody. So... Just pointing that out, sorry, jumping on that wagon, but it is something that I am passionate about. The, the key is have a conversation. Are we training or are we fighting? Because you, you give them the best fight, they're, they'll learn how to give you the best fight back. Right. The other piece is, and this goes to Rifkin, it's, or actually it was best, actually, sorry. You have to give, that equal chance and and that is for awards and everything else and that comes along with allowing to learn from women fighters and fighters that are just you know that that are better than you 
And, you know, that chance comes along with, if somebody's a good teacher and help you runs you through training drills and helps you with training drills, helps you find books that are good reference to, to get you through stuff. Those are ways that they serve and they earn the right to be, you know, counted among, you know, these people that are great trainers. You have to give them that, uh, that, that place and, and that equal chance to do that. If you're just tuning them out because you don't think somebody has something to give you, well, just be careful with that because that'll go, that'll go right past when people start turning you out because you're not willing to listen to others. So that's a warning to you trainers out there. If you're not willing to listen to somebody, then people start tuning you out as well. All right, I'm off my soapbox once again. <laughs> Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll wrap up by saying, uh, you know, when I when I first started fighting, um, very early on, we had uh, Sir Leah Dispenser uh, here in in my barony, and I watched her get knighted in 1985. And uh, some time around that that same time frame, I met uh, Sir Hillary of Serendip, who I think was on the board of directors at the time. Uh, so, as far as I've known, women have always been knights uh, in our sport. And, and that's really never been that big of a deal to me. Um, and so it's always been normal to me, uh, but I have seen a lot of, I, you know, mid eighties was, was kind of a rough time for women in our sport. And I, and I've seen it. And, and um, I have, I have benefited enormously as a trainer from being able to have candid conversations with women in our sport chiefly among them, Sir Rifkin and uh, Vigdis, uh, Sir Helga, um, currently of, of my unbelted uh, students, you know, three out of the four of my students right now are, are, are women. And that was something that only occurred to me just recently in part of this conversation was like, oh, wait, no, uh, no, they're all, you know, three out of four. Um, and I've been trying to normalize this for a long time because to me, it's always been normal. And I get this wrong, you know, I'm still working at this. I, I have had these conversations with, with these, these women fighters where I'm like, is this really a thing? And Rifkin's like, oh, come on, Sean. Yeah, that's totally a thing. Um, you know, it's like this, this whole uh, imposter syndrome, this fraud thing, like, I feel like a fraud is like, is that real? It's like, yeah, that's real. Um, have those, at, if you want to be a trainer in our sport, and I encourage everybody to do so have these conversations with women, listen to them, shut up and listen, um, stop making statements and start asking questions. All of the women in our sport are more than happy to answer an honest question and to, to educate you and to help give you that perspective. You just have to be willing to listen to it. So stop making statements, start asking questions, let them help you become better trainers. And, and the final thought on this is sometimes, uh, sometimes we think we're helping and we're not. And we need to be aware of that. And sometimes we are helping, but we can always be helping more. It's nice. It's, it's not enough to be, as, as Rifkin has put it, it's not enough to, for us to be allies anymore. We need to be agitators. Um, we, we need to stop accepting women in our sport and, and start inviting them and making this a place where they can succeed, not just, not just exist. So, um, whew, sorry. Hey, I John, a, got a sorry, question a for you. What are we doing next week? <laughs> So next week on the Coach's Corner, we have a conversation with uh, Count Ulrich von, von Brandenburg from down in Meridies. Really looking forward to having that conversation with him. Um, always great to get uh, some perspective uh, on, on how some of these guys, uh, some of these fighters um, uh, think about fighting and their training process. Um, so otherwise, uh, I would like to thank uh, Bronos for co-hosting with me, but more importantly, to all the ladies that were kind enough to join us and, and quite frankly, wow. trusting, trusting us with this conversation. Um, thank you all for, um, for coming on and, and lending your voice 
to this. Uh, it's, it's been important. I have learned a great deal just talking with each of you um, in, in preparing for this episode alone. Uh, so thank you. Thank you all so very much. And uh, as always, uh, we got to have Vesper uh, show her lovely face uh, so we can give yeah. our, our weekly thanks to her and all her efforts. And uh, before she, she pops, uh, I, the one thing I would ask everybody is uh, give us some feedback uh, on the episode when uh, we repost it. I thought it was great, um, except for me, who, who gets on the soapbox quite often. Um, but uh, uh, give us some feedback because uh, I, you guys didn't get to see, but they, they have an incredible document here that had a lot of other things on it. And I'm not sure if it doesn't, you know, we, we don't look at maybe had, talking about some more of this down the road. We had a good audience participation. We had 50 plus people just watching tonight. And uh, I, I don't mind. I would love to have some more talk about this and just make it normalize it, ask, get more questions going. So from the audience and, uh, and do another episode somewhere. Okay. So Vesper, our greatest thanks as, as always for uh, your continued efforts and keeping us on track and getting these things going. We really appreciate everything you do week in and week out. Thank you all. And thanks to everybody that tuned in. Can you guys hear me? Is this working? Yep. Okay, yeah. Okay. Oof. okay. Thank you to everybody that tuned in and be sure to come back on Friday for another awesome episode with the Coach's Corner and head over there to their Facebook page. And as always, thanks to the wonderful guests and our coaches. We'll see everybody next weekend. Right thanks, Thank everybody. you. Have a good night. Bye.